that was our promotion. It was thumbtacked to one of the pillars in the middle of the club for maybe a week. We had six people there. <laughs> six people. That's humbling. Yeah. And they didn't like it. Hey, this is Party Like a Rockstar podcast, and I'm your host, Joel. Today's episode is brought to you by Misha's Kind Foods. They're an LA-based small business making the world's finest non-dairy cheese on the market today. They're lactose-free, paleo, keto, kosher, perev, and 100% vegan. If you like what you see, check out the next video. If you like this video, please subscribe and like by clicking the little round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or our other guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle is Joel Rohde. If you haven't already read my book, Memoir of a Rohde, it's now available through Amazon and paperback Kindle or as an audio book. I hope you enjoy the show. You're the best. <laughs> nice glasses. Yeah, when you get to be my age, you'll see. You look like a college professor for people who don't need to go to college. <laughs> yeah, I do a lot with that degree. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I met a guy that knows you and your brother, Timmy. I didn't know you had a brother. I don't. You don't have a brother, Timmy? No. Oh. Yeah, we must be pretty close if he knows my yeah, brother, Yeah, I was going to say. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Funny story. Everybody knows you. It's great. I'm a noble guy. <laughs> all right <clears throat> if you guys are ready we can start yeah i'm ready cool. right on tj hoffman is my first guest he's toured with mod agnostic front american angel ignite and skid row as a tour manager drum tech and guitar tech he's a filmmaker and is the man responsible for the award-winning documentary titled roadie my documentary Dave the Snake Sabo is my second guest. He's best known as the guitarist of the band Skid Row. So I watched an interview with Wait, you. Wait, TJ gets a bigger intro than I do. What the crap is that? He's a roadie. You're not. I sent the email. <laughs> That's true. You sent Listen it to me a rock That's star. You I'm just a guest. That's true. Too. <laughs> Actually, I got, so I got something for you here. So in an interview you did, I watched a couple and they talk about like how you guys came up with your songs. And you were talking about how important it is to have metaphors when you come yes. up with a song. So I want a metaphor on TJ Hoffman. If you can't come up with oh. something, I got an A, B, and C for you. Oh, a shining great. light in a road of darkness. <laughs> Fuck, he's so good. He's so good. Not. So here's my three. You can pick which one's best. All right. <laughs> TJ is like a caterpillar who's become a magnific magnificent, beautiful butterfly but just wants to be a caterpillar again, dressed in black. Wow. Yeah, okay, but there's more. I got a theme too, you'll see. This is about caterpillars too, so. TJ is like a Tonka truck who wants to play with the big kids and be a Caterpillar 797. I looked it up online. That's the biggest fucking Caterpillar truck they make. But he's held back because he prefers the music of Skid Row to Justin Bieber. <laughs> Ah, that's pretty close that's debatable <laughs> and see tj has the drive of a locomotive because he's built like a brick shit house and not a plastic barbie mansion you sure about that <laughs> i don't know my girlfriend said that's not a metaphor because locomotive has nothing <laughs> that's to true. do with it. It, it technically it's not but <laughs> yeah so i was like oh well whatever <laughs> Anyway, all right, so we'll get into it. Serious questions. So I guess you were a pretty good athlete, Snake. You were I was like you you played baseball and stuff. And this is I played baseball. baseball and basketball as a kid, and and baseball was something that I actually was was pretty good at. And but I went to see KISS on December 16th of 1977 at Madison Square Garden. And I'm gonna name drop so because I went with my uh, one of my best friends who lives up the street from me, John, or lived up the street from me, John Bon Jovi, and we took the train from South Amboy, New Jersey, that goes straight underneath the Garden Penn Station. And I, after I left there, before I left there, I was a jock looking forward to going baseball practice, bas actually basketball practice at that time. And then I got out of there and I was like, 
I have to be involved in this somehow. Like I've got to do this. This was the most life-changing moment in my life. Seeing this, uh, this spectacular show that I had never seen the likes of ever before and seeing the bass player breathe fire and spit blood on these, you know, six inch, eight inch platforms and these uh, uh, levitate, this, the whole production, the levitating stage that would come down at the beginning of the show, the uh, rising drum riser for Peter Chris's drum solo and the, and the lights and the pyrotechnics. And there was not a moment during that show where you were, where you felt like, yeah, you know what? Now we can go get a beer, <laughs> even at 13 years old, you know? And so- Were you already I, playing uh, guitar? No, oh, no. no so I had no idea what I wanted. Like, I just knew that I wanted to be a part of that somehow in any way that I could. And so John started playing guitar and he's a few years older than me. And coincidentally, one of my older brothers, not named Tim or, or <laughs> um, one of my older brothers decided that he was going to attempt to play guitar as well. And he picked up uh, an acoustic guitar, believe it or not, because it did exist from, from the Sears catalog that used to get sent to people's houses from the Sears and Roebuck company. And you're not my, aging yourself a fucking second there. Oh, dude, are you kidding me? I'm 112. So I, wrote, I, I think I put it in my book. I can't remember, but I wrote it was um, a Playboy Playmate used to be like, yeah. Now it's like, oh, fuck, she's just old. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. But I still have a uh, Playboy Playmate like figure from the neck down. You just can't see it. So we uh, my <laughs> close brother, your eyes, TJ. Close your eyes. <laughs> my my brother picked up this guitar, and it was a horrible, horrible guitar. Um, and he played for about three weeks, and he gave it up. And the fact that you know my buddy started playing up the street, and it looked really cool. Um, and my brother gave up on it. I felt it was an opportunity for me to outdo my brother in some way. Yeah. Uh, it was a challenge. So I picked up the guitar and it was so hard to play. And immediately my fingers started, you know, bleeding and getting calluses, the whole story that you hear, but I was really determined. And it was, it felt like it was the perfect vehicle for me to actually be able to express myself from an, an emotional standpoint that I didn't, wasn't capable of any other way. Like it was the first vessel I had to uh, communicate somehow because my communications at that point, my, my social interactions was, I was just the goofy guy. Like I was the guy that was always telling jokes and stuff like that. And, and the truth of the matter was I just, that's how I wanted to get attention. I didn't want attention on anything else just that aspect of it was fine. Like I didn't want to expose myself emotionally and, you know, whether I was hurt over a girlfriend breaking up, you know, shit, adolescent stuff that you go through that I chose. How many that brothers I do want. you have? Four older brothers. Wow. So when you talk about 18 in life and in the thing, you said it was about your brother initially, is this the same brother? No, different brother. Uh, it, uh, ironically, uh, I, my old, my brother's range uh, my oldest brother is 20 years older than me. So oh, I was, I was a uh, unhappy accident to, to my parents <laughs> and I was supposed to be the girl. So I've attempted to live up to that um, since my inception. And so There's more we, of these uh, hair jokes, TJ, look at them, man. <laughs> exactly. Great. So yeah, the guitar, the guitar became my passion and I gave up all sports nearly immediately to the dismay of my family, uh, especially one of my uncles who was a uh, played semi pro ball and oh. thought I had a future as as a baseball player. And and it's really strange because at age 14, I had a very clear idea of what I wanted to do. And then it was just a case of executing it. And lo and behold, I had a great teacher and a mentor throughout my whole life, which is John, because obviously everybody knows the success that he's attained. And I learned so much and still do, to be honest. I mean, we're still very close. So um, that was like, it, that was the path that was uh, waiting for me to walk down. And it was just yeah. inevitable that I would. And so, but, you know, you go through a lot of conflict and you realize that uh, these, at least for me, the people that I had become tight with that were on all these different sports teams that I played on. Uh, once I stopped coming around and uh, I was, I was ostracized from that click yeah. in that community. 
So now I was no longer a jock, but I wasn't cool enough to be a dirtbag. So I was caught somewhere in, in uh, Katie's. And it was, uh, I guess that propelled me to, to isolate myself and just play guitar, which is what I did. Speaking of dirt bags, uh, TJ. <laughs> 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 All right. So basically from your doc, I, I'm not going to spoil anything, um, but uh, I, I think it's okay to say, so you got into being a roadie because of beer and uh, 50 bucks a day on a good day is pretty much is, is pretty, but I, I've heard this story before somewhere. So uh, what do you think like drove you to music? Because what I did see is that, so you, you went on your own acumen to go to a uh, recording s- school. I mean, you, you had full intention of making this a career like pretty early on. So it wasn't just about the beer. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it did start out that way. Just, you know, kind of lugging some, uh, some cabinets and there was a, a, a club in New Jersey here, which, which the band I was with played a lot, uh, studio one. Oh, um, yeah. the worst <laughs> The worst loading in the world, man. Exactly. So that's kind of where it's where I was in in need more or less. And uh, they had the second, the third floor was the stage. The second floor was the bar, and the first floor was the load-in. And uh, I always seemed to find my way from the third floor after loading right to the second floor in the bar. Yeah. Even at nineteen <laughs> with the fake ID and everything, and then there was a lot of women, a lot of girls, and big hair. It was a great time for music, especially in the New Jersey era. Oh yeah, and uh, it it just it kind of it just led to me being around the scene more and more and more, where I thought I could maybe make a little bit more money, and I could maybe if I if I learned one more thing, maybe I could take that guy's job, and if they didn't have to pay that guy fifty dollars to drive, maybe I could drive for, and I can get to twenty five and make a deal with the band, and that's how it kind of it progressed, and then. Um, the bass player that I was working for was a engineer at a, a studio in South River, New Jersey called Tracks East. I'm sure Snake remembers that place. Of course I do, Eric. Yeah. So Steve was the uh, was the engineer there and I was uh, kind of piggybacking off him over his shoulder on a couple of things where he would have me come in and, and help him. And I was learning the two inch tape machine and I was learning different sounds and tones and I took it a little bit more serious in the studio and then I took a little bit more serious on stage not that that ever seriousness bypassed the drinking part because the drinking was always there for me yeah um, but I but I kind of curbed it as best I could to to take the job serious do you still drink and I do not I actually that just celebrated 15 that. years clean hey congrats man yeah thank you and uh the, the you know the, the the hardest part is to be in that environment and not to partake with 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 the partying um yeah i bet it was a lot of fun years 15 years yeah i I quit in 06 was i quit a year before my my youngest son was born and uh i just one day just had enough and stopped and never went back just congratulations that's really something it is it's awesome good for you so that's part of the my when the when the film changed from the documentary to my documentary there i had so much old footage um, archive from the eighties and nineties killer that, footage, by the way, there's so, and there's, there's still so much that never even made the film. We did so much stuff. And the editor that I was working with said, TG, you know, this is, there's really a good threat thread here for your story. And I was like, I, I don't want that. Like, I don't want to be, I don't want to be on film. Like I'm so much more comfortable behind the camera and, and the same I thing. Know, I, was so much more- was, I was fun to watch you weave in and out. Cause we're hearing, I think you have to have an individual story to relate to a bigger story. Otherwise, what's my connection? What do I care? Well, that was kind of the whole thing with music. Like I, I, I play very little guitar, very little drums, just enough to get by, you know, yeah. and back in the day, we, you could get by with just a couple of chords, a couple of lines, a couple of snare kick type of thing to get by. Nowadays it's totally different. I could never be quote unquote tech at this point. It, there's, it's so far advanced. But yeah. what it did was it get me, got me more and more involved where people took me a little bit more serious that I could do all these little things and, and get by. Cause I did take it kind of serious. And Can that's just think about learning how to play anything. No, done. I'm too old for that. Yeah. See, I'm not <laughs> either. I had uh, I was, I was touring with STP and I would take Dean's guitar and I'd fuck around with it. And honestly, he was totally cool that he didn't care at all. Or maybe he never knew the guitar tech. I don't either way. It didn't matter. CC was giving me uh, guitar lessons when I was in the recording studio. 
So I was on tour with STP and my boss cruised over. You might know him, Charlie Hernandez Snake. Did you? Did yes, you know of course. Charlie. So he cruised over. He goes, How's it going there? I'm like, Oh, it's good, sir. You know, it's good. He goes, Yeah, it's good. You're fucking around like rock star guitar. You having a good time? Okay, I get it. <laughs> you yeah. know, I was like, with the guitar bag, went back in the fucking bus and sit there eating donuts or whatever. I don't know what I did, but I was like, oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, was like, I, I took it serious for a little bit. And Snake had, we had, geez, probably eight guitars out on that 2000 tour with the different tunings and everything. And it was, it was fun for me to be able to change strings and play and hit some chords and stuff. And there was times in and out of that tour where I took it like, wow, this is great yeah and then the the crown royal was on the bus and i just couldn't i had to go <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you had a lot more responsibility than just doing that i mean you were you were tour manager you were keeping everything together with the the minimal amount of crew people that we had at that time and you know there was a, and and the fact that you know we were living up to whatever re- reputation that we had uh built for ourselves throughout the years and it wasn't like that we were these young 18 year old kids anymore, but we were certainly acting like it. I mean, yeah. we're on, we're out touring with kiss, you know, our, our heroes and we've got to play 45 minutes a night. That's like nothing. That's like, if you, you say, I'm going to work out and you go on a treadmill for three minutes, you know, it's like, it's, it's nothing. And were you so still we watching had, Kiss after all the shows? Were you still ev- almost time? every show, man? And there was, I'd want to say, 127 shows that we did, and nearly every one we would spend in the in a photographer's pit, watching that whole thing like this close. Because <laughs> and then and then the the 13, 15, 14, 15 year old kid of me was on display every night because that's everything that I had ever wanted seeing that show in Madison Square Garden was given to me on that tour. And it happened so much later in our career. I mean, we had been around for 14, 15 years at that point. And so to have this gift of being able to go out with your heroes and have them treat you so kindly. Yeah. Um, and then there's a camaraderie that that was built between all of the crew guys and, and us too. We were we've always been very interactive with our crew. Like I've always uh, attempted to let people know that work with us, that they work with us. So like, the crew I'm not stay the in the same buses and the same hotels. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not the guy who says, Oh, you work for me. It's like, no, 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 man, you work with us. Like we're a team here. And you know, there's that Henry Rollins statement that gets put up on venues every once in a while. It talks about, you know, band members, no one wants to hear you cry and bitch about how hard you have it to go on stage for an hour and a half. These guys have been here long before you got here or will be here long after you leave. And I always found that to be very, very refreshing and humbling yeah. uh, and true. And so I, I've become friends with so many of our crew guys over the years and have remained friends because I was always you know, we've done, let me backtrack a second. We've all, we've done everything from clubs to where six people were in it to stadiums where there was a hundred thousand people in it, you know, playing in Russia or playing Wembley or, or playing giant stadium yeah, uh, and everything in between. And so obviously the crews that you work with, whether they be your own or the headliner, or if you're, you're the headliner, um, and there's a lot of business that goes along with that. And so therefore there's a lot more people added to your, you know, the list of, of personnel on the, on the itinerary. And um, I always found the camaraderie was really, really important. And so, and then just, uh, just being respectful of the job that these guys do and recognizing that, because I would, I, I would be amazed. Like I would be up till four o'clock in the morning with some of the guys on the crew knowing that they had to get up at seven to start putting this loading in. And I get to stroll in at three o'clock for sound check. I mean, you know, my hangover has gone. And I was always amazed by how these guys did this night after night after night. And that, and then we leave our tour and go out with another tour and another tour and another tour. Uh, what do you think, TJ? Do we take them off the asshole rock rock star list, or do we still leave them on? No, totally. All, all the guys. I don't know about this. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, all, I could say that for Snake for sure. He was always in part of like he was one of the guys, one hundred percent. And uh, you know, broke my balls a lot, but but at the end of the day, all the guys. And thank God that everybody was cool enough to get along uh, as as you know, a hundred and some. I only did about a hundred and I think four or five shows. Only um, about, <laughs> yeah, only seriously. About. Yeah. So, okay. So you're, you're with American angel. I got that far. And then how did you switch over to the skid row camp? I'm assuming that's what happened or. It, it was so weird. So, so I was with, you know, I was with American angels in tracks East and, and uh, they were re- in and out of recording. Steve recorded in 1992, recorded the MOD record rhythm of fear with Billy Milano, uh, Timmy McMurtry, the original USA for MOD lineup. And I interned, uh, in the studio at that time, I got to be friends with Billy and Timmy and they were doing some shows to limelight and I worked for them. And then they went right to Europe and Billy says like, come to Europe with us. Okay. Like, you know, it was like 40 days. It was like 38 shows in 40 days, three bands on a bus, hardcore throughout mm-hmm. Europe. I'm in, fuck it. Let's go. Right. And, uh, and that just led to meeting more friends. I met some guys out in California. I met some friends from Belgium and I just stayed in that little hardcore circle of of music which was everywhere from playing small venues like the garage in london where it's 250 people and then going to play lowlands dynamo which was a hundred thousand people the festivals were it was i got the full spectrum and it was it was a rush it was amazing yeah, so i stayed in that for a long long time um coming off one of the tours here in new jersey i was home i was at a local gin mill and tried to pick up this girl in a bar lo and behold it was the the wife of the drummer that was in Skid Row at the time he was with another band. But uh, so I got to be friends with them guys and they were doing a side project, the, the Ozone Monday project right. with Snake and, and Rachel and Scotty. And, and I started to work with the drummer a little bit. And, we, and, and then Charlie calls you and goes, Hey, if, if there's an opportunity to go on the road and do, you know, open up for the kiss, would you be interested? And it probably took me about not even a half of a millisecond to go, I'm in. Yeah, man. <laughs> I've never done an arena tour. You know, I was just this hardcore kid. I'm not a musician. I never was that guy that could pick up the guitar and shred and go out there and do sound checks and do all this stuff. Like, I, I didn't really care about that. But the atmosphere of live shows and, and having some kind of a little bit of pride that you, you set that up, you pull that off. You know, I really tried and Snake's going to he's going to disagree with me. But I really tried to take headaches away from the band as a as a tech ah! as a roadie, as a tour manager. You try to make their job as easy as possible so they can roll out of bed, get dressed, go on stage, play, hand everything off. And the next day it's it's there. And the trust that these guys put in me, um, you know, I had a lot on my shoulders to make that happen. And. And I'll never forget the look that Snake gave me in, in one cold Fargo dome when the 12 string was so out of tune, the look of death. I mean, I failed miserably. <laughs> but at the same time, I learned. I learned a lot about you know instruments and music. And, and, and Dean, who was teching for Ted Nugent at the time, he took me under his wing. He said, here, this is how you don't make that happen again. And it was like, you know, when you're a kid and you get beat, uh, you know, with the belt by your pot because you fucked up, you never make that mistake again. And, and I learned from that. And that that just made me, um, I think, a better TM and a better guy to be on the road with, you know, with that crew. I, I hate the fact that I, I always re, I always feel terrible when that look comes across. But uh, unfortunately, you're in that moment and and you know that the audience isn't looking behind the amp line. The audience is looking at me and I'm going, Oh God, like, Oh God, it's so like you hear, I was going through my monitors and you hear how bad it is. And I think the look comes from knowing there's nothing I could do right now. Like there, I have to live through this right now, but those yeah. things are few and far between. Like it happens. You're and, welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah. And there's no, there's no like we the four there, o'clock in the morning shit where we wanted to go to sleep. Exactly. <laughs> well, there's and there's that moment where you go, you have a discussion about it after the show, or it might happen during the show, and it's over. It's done. Yeah. It's yeah. done. And that's because of that. Again, like TJ said, there is a trust there that that occurs. And I, you know what? There's this thing. 
about being from New Jersey too, where you might be at odds with each other or something like that, but you will always have that person's back. If an outsider comes into that circle, like you could be brawling with each other in the middle of that circle, but someone comes in and tries to infiltrate that, they're going to get knocked out. And that by someone in that circle, protecting someone else in that circle. And so there's always that underlying respect for one another uh, that never goes away. And I mean, I'll tell you what, when we first started Skid Row, we were getting ready to go on the road. Um, I had some of my friends who had been working with me when I was in cover bands playing uh, in the Union Jack in South River, New Jersey, and the Fountain Casino in Aberdeen, New Jersey, and you know Club and A, as, as TJ mentioned in the documentary, and uh, Birch Hill, which we loved. And anyway, um, one of the guys' name was Chris Moore, called him Moore's Head. He, I've known him since he was four years old. He grew up on a street next to me, and we played baseball and hung out together. We were, you know, great friends. And another guy was named Ron Oldenburg, Ronzo, and he had a pickup truck. So naturally, we got him on board to take the amps and the band and the, and the two of us, or two of them, were there the whole time. Uh, and then when I started working at a music store down in Tom's River, and that's where I met Rachel, and we started, we were the nucleus of, of Skid Row. And there was a guy that I worked with who was a great tech guy and played guitar. His name was Chuck Lebrecht. So he was working as we were building Skid Row and as a club band, playing everywhere and anywhere we could. So he became a part of it. Now, all these people, especially Ronzo and, and, and Morshead, were friends. Like they were just guys that had never, ever done anything like this before. So, and then we had a front of house guy, a uh, local guy, Jimmy Vanzino, who I had known throughout the years of, of having my friend, like John Bon Jovi's band, he would work with them. Um, and he, he actually played as a guitar player in a number of bands, switched to front of house and became a, a really good front of house guy. So he was a friend and we were like, well, okay, let's, let's see if we can use him on shows. And then all of a sudden we get signed and the record's coming out and we're on the bond. We're getting ready to do the Bon Jovi tour and in comes McGee entertainment, you know, big management company and throwing a lot of weight around. And they're like, well, we got to get you guys, you know, like a real crew. And we're like, fuck off. Like these guys have been here since day one. And they're like, well, your bass tech Ronzo can't even play the bass. It's like, no, but he can tune it. And he could set it up and he could plug it in and, and, you know, Morsehead can't play the drums, but he can hit the crap out of each drum separately. He could hit a cymbal and he could fix it if he needs to. And they'll learn as we do. And so the Bon Jovi crew guys were like, ha, 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 this is going to be fun. And we had set carts on the stage for the back line and stuff. And so. So Bon Jovi was with Doc McGee too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it was just us and Bon Jovi, and they were taking us out on the New Jersey tour, and, and an unknown band is playing sold-out arenas because they didn't need us. No one knew us. Our record didn't even come out. Well, I think our record came out three days before the first show. So did did John hook you up with Doc? That's how. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, absolutely. Um, and but we we had we had and that was the bond that I'm talking about, like. No, we're bringing our friends with us, like, because they will always have our back and they'll learn because they're not stupid and they know how important this is. How many shows and they're have you get done like before this tour with Bon Jovi? Had you guys done a lot of dates together? Yeah, we did a lot of dates with uh, a singer before Sebastian, a guy by the name of Matt Fallon, who's from New Brunswick and or North Brunswick. And he, uh, he didn't work out. It got to the point where we were able to open up a, a few shows on the Bon Jovi Slippery When Wet Tour before Cinderella could join. And we had no record, no nothing, obviously. Uh, but John was like, hey, you want to come out and play these few shows in, in Pennsylvania? And we're like, Stabler Arena? Of course. And so there, there's like 8,000 people there and we're playing and Doc McGee comes into our dressing room, who I had known about because I'm big into the music business and I always looked about 
who produced records on the back of the record, who managed the band, who their accountants were, all that stuff. And um, so Doc comes back and I had known him as well through John since I was 19. I guess at this point I was 21, 22. And he comes back in the dressing room and he looks at Rachel and he goes, I love the songs, but your singer's got to go. Oh, So we're like, wow, we just got done playing in front of 8,000 people. They actually liked us. But in my opinion, the best manager in the business just said, you're 80% of the way there. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, put a lot of weight into what he had to say. I put, we, we said, how can you, how can you not listen to what this guy is saying, considering the yeah. careers that he's guided and is guiding? Yeah. And yes. so we were like, okay. And we said to Matt, uh, as, as respectfully as possible, that we're, you know, we're going to move on. And then thus began a nine-month search for a singer. And we auditioned so many people from New York and New Jersey and, and Pennsylvania. And thanks to a, uh, an ad in the back of Metal Edge, small band, you know, uh, New Jersey band, going to be on, uh, you know, uh, tour at some point, you know, as vaguely as possible, because John was like, look, you guys get it together. I'll, I'll help you out as much as I can. And doc said the same thing because they really did love the songs. And so, and the, and the, and the band that we had created minus a singer. So a nine month search went on where we got to the point where we were just like, man, let's just do a four piece punk Ramones-esque band, you know, and Rach, you sing and, you know, we'll play clubs and that'll be it. And then uh, through uh, Mark Weiss and uh, got his friend Dave Feld and ironically, Mr. and Mrs. Bon Jovi, believe it or not, uh, they were all at Mark Weiss's wedding and Sebastian was there singing uh, as one of Mark's guests. He was playing in a band called Madam X. And Zach Wilde had just gotten the gig playing with Ozzy, who Zach was a, a very good friend and would come into the music store and stuff. And so uh, he, I think he was, Sebastian had just left Madam X. And so we sent him a four song demo tape up to Toronto and he learned it. And we flew him down to New Jersey. And the first thing he, well, we did was we went to this club called Mingles uh, Route 35 in Old Bridge or Sarable, however, it was like right there. And we kind of owned the place. Like the owner was like, just let us do whatever we wanted. I mean, he was so kind to us, this guy, Rich Hennessy and his wife. And they, uh, we had carte blanche with everything. So there was two rooms. There was one big room up top that had held probably, probably close to, you know, a thousand people. And then there was a room on the bottom that was like this small cool bar, kind of like the court tavern in, in, in New Brunswick. Uh, it was an old kind of punk bar, which was great. Um, seeing Bobby Ebbs' genocide down there, the crazy. And uh, we would, we went downstairs and asked the band if we could get up and play. So there was never really, that was the audition. And we were terrible. Uh, we were really terrible. And, but we, that's the night we announced that, okay, this is our new singer, Sebastian. And then, we got in a rehearsal room, which uh, became Rachel's parents' garage down in Tom's River, which made sense because I was down there all the time working at the music store. I had gotten Scotty a job down there as well, and Rachel was down there. Uh, Rob, our drummer, lived pretty close to that area. And so uh, Sebastian started living at, at Rachel's mom and dad's house, and, and we rehearsed every day you know propane so at this heater. point is doc mcgee i mean he knows that you guys got a singer i'm just trying to i'm basically trying to wonder did he approve sebastian like earlier or you guys approved him and then doc was like no nah, this guy could even though you're saying it wasn't the best first show was doc well, he wasn't there aware? for that and and we no. we obviously when we got down into the to the garage we were you know we were we were fiercely committed like when we jammed and rehearsed it wasn't just for an hour or two and it wasn't, we didn't drink during rehearsal. 
uh, we didn't party at all. It was it was business, man, because <clears throat> you had opportunity, we, man. You're knowing. Well, you we know. didn't and we didn't want to be like the best band on the on the Jersey club circuit. We wanted to be the best arena band, you know, like that's where our sites were. Um, and so we did everything that we could. We rehearsed every day uh, to the point that it was uh, utterly ridiculous. And, you know, like even like John would come down to rehearsals. He's like, my God, man, how long do you guys rehearse for? <laughs> and it was hours, like six, seven hours or, or whatever time we could go until they cut us off. Uh, because of a you know local sound curfew or whatever, but because of how diligent we were were rehearsals, and how how good that came across when we started playing live, because we had some sort of a following at that point when Matt was our singer, we had developed a pretty good following, and that just increased when we when we went back out, and so I'll never forget this one day Rachel and I are at John's house and. Doc is there and we're talking about, okay, like, okay, we got it together. And Doc's not in this conversation yet. And John, Rachel and I are talking about, you know, the, the way the band is and, and songs and stuff like that and what the future might hold. And all of a sudden Doc McGee walks over, John walks away, Doc McGee walks over and goes, so this is what we're going to do. Like Rachel and I look at each other like, okay, cool. And he starts laying out this game plan. And we're like, we're looking at each other like, this is like, this is great. Like all the ideas that he's got are the, the perfect pathway for the opportunity to succeed, you know, in the mind of a 22 year old kid. Um, and then we kind of look at each other and he walks away and Rachel looks at me and goes, is Doc McGee managing us? And I go, I, I go, I don't know. So we go to lunch and we're all having lunch together. And, and I forget which one of us asked the question, but we were like, so are, are you managing us? And he's like, well, yeah. And we we're like, wow. Like we didn't even ask. <laughs> it was just a really cool way for it to happen. Yeah. Because as soon as I saw Doc McGee's name on the back of uh, Too Fast for Love, Motley Crue's first record. And then, then when I'm 19 and John says he's at his parents' house with Doc and says, you got to come up and meet my manager. And I'm going, who? And he's like, Doc McGee. I go, I know that name. Like, I know that name. He manages Motley Crue. He goes, yeah. So I went up and I met him. And he's laying out by, by the pool and stuff like that. And, and I'm being like quiet and hanging out. And then John walks in the, in the house and I go, this is my opportunity. And so I lay like this 10 minute speech on him about how I'm, you know, I'm the best guitar player, not just here, but in the world. And I'm going to be a rock star and you're going to know who I am. And I only have a, I have a band at this point. You know, I'm just, but I'm laying down every bit of, of uh, gravitas that I can to, uh, to imp like, hopefully impress this guy and, and, and make it, you know, just make an impression and have me be on his radar somehow. And so, uh, and this is a true story, man. He respectfully let me go on for, I guess it was like 10 minutes and of me just patting myself on the back and, and it probably felt like an hour and a half to him looking back <laughs> on it. And he, I, I'm done. And he goes, Oh, okay. You done. And I go, yeah. He goes, that's great. Go get me a beer. <laughs> and that was it. And I was like, Oh, wow. Like Fred Flintstone and Mr. Slate's office. Like, boo. And, <laughs> come to three years later he's managing me and and my band so what's it like now because you're managing you've been for a long time so you were doing down so when you did you already know those guys i assume you kind of did before you started managing them and then how did you decide you were going to go into management did you talk to doc did he talk to you or well i worked i worked with mcgee entertainment um right because i was always doc and his brother scott 
And Scott did all our, you know, he was our day-to-day guy. He was with us every show. Really, really smart guy. He was coming up in the ranks just like we were. So he was as hungry as us to be successful and to hopefully get out of his brother's shadow um, and have his, him be able to stand on his own through his own merits. So we were very, very much into this together. And Doc was overseeing it, uh, but he was also doing, you know, Bon Jovi and, and excuse me, Motley Crue. Motley, actually, his partner was more so doing Motley Crue, Doug Thaler. And the Scorpions. And so uh, I was, Doc and Scott used to call me the gnat because I was always like right here, you know, like, because I wanted to understand what they did. And I, I was, I was really adamant about understanding the business of music, which ironically is the title of the book that I bought to learn the business of music. Billboard used to sell these books. And that was like the Bible. And I read through that when I was like 18 years old and I wanted to understand all the aspects of it, you know, mechanical licenses and, you know, um, how publishing works and, and how royalties work, uh, you know, what's recoupable, what's cross collateralizing, all, all these things that a normal 18, 19 year old kid isn't going to know because I wanted to be a guy that could sit, in a meeting with a Doug Morris, who at the time was president of Atlantic Records and obviously went on to become just a legendary figure and executive. I wanted to be able to sit there and be in a room with him and Jason Flom and Tun Jerem and know what the fuck I was talking about. Like, I didn't want to be the stupid Polish kid in the corner who plays guitar. You know, I wanted to be educated enough that they weren't going to get anything past my head. Hmm. Like I could understand it. Now there's a difference between understanding it and knowing what is right and what is wrong from percentage standpoints and things like that. And what is fair, put it that way. And the only way that you have knowledge of that is just by knowing if you're lucky, what other people's particular deals are. Yeah, And so you can go, oh, wait a second, you're offering us 13% and this amount of an advance and this amount of, uh, you know, marketing and promotion dollars and this amount of tour support, but you're attempting to recoup it across the board. Well, that, that, that doesn't work for us, you know? So, and so just having that understanding, not that, look, Doc and Scott knew far more than I did, which is why I was the parrot on their shoulder learning about this and learning about the the aspects of touring and merchandising and things of that nature so uh and that my fascination with that never went away so when the time came around 2006 where we were taking uh, quite a break and uh as skid row and i was living in los angeles at the time and i was kind of tempting to figure out what my deal was like what's the next step you know like and Movie i always want tracks in my friend's living room all night <laughs> right exactly <laughs> yep i remember that um but i uh i thought to myself you know doc's office is like right down the street <laughs> duh you know let me go in and and so doc didn't completely have faith in me at first uh neither did scott and so I was getting, I don't want to say a runaround, but they're like, yeah, yeah, maybe, 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 maybe. And I kept badgering them. And, and then one day I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to make myself unremovable. And so I started showing up at the office every day. And at the time there was, there was probably 12 people in that office. And I, there was a central area where there was a bunch of desks and then there was kind of offices surrounding it. The sunset tower building. Was Marie uh, already there? What's that? Marie Matthews? Yes, of course. Whom I love. I love. Yeah, she's, Obviously, she's you know that. Yes, um, yes. And I uh, I just started showing up every day and making my presence known and just offering, hey, what are you working on? How can I help? Like, how can I help? You want me to make copies of a contract or something? They're like, do it. Oh, guy, go away. <laughs> Pretty much. And then an opportunity came up 
to work on a uh, festival for to support the troops at Camp Pendleton in Southern California. Yeah. So it was a it was a big event, uh, and there was going to be sixty thousand people there on the beach. This massive staging because Kiss was headlining, and there was about twelve other artists on the bill. Cedric the Entertainer, Jay Moore, Godsmack, uh, you know Ted Nugent, Richie Sambora, um, Ja Rule, Destiny's Child, and. Doc's like, okay, here's your gig. You're the li liaison to all the artists. I'm like, all right. How hard can that be? I'm an artist. I get it. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so the, 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 the putting it together was we would have meetings every Every week, uh, there was a gentleman by the name of Jerry Inzarello that was running point. And he basically is the head of the Atlantis uh, resorts and, and stuff like that. Very, very powerful guy and really good guy. And they were, they were doing this on behalf of his boss. Uh, and I got a Joe... Uh, Incinera, I think his name was. No, 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 that wasn't it. But anyway, on behalf of that, who had a strong affiliation with the troops, I believe someone in his family was was in the uh, military, and it was a gargantuan task, and but we were able to pull it off. But we're sitting there going through budgets, and there's thirty people in a conference room, and. And I'm in there. I'm like, okay, you know, hair down to my ass. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm the guy that you guys are going to communicate with to communicate with, uh, you know, Beyonce. Okay. So I am have a liaison, which makes sense because I'm dealing with 12, 12 different productions, if you will. I mean, Destiny's Child have 53 people. And that's just Destiny's Child. You know, Kiss has however many people. Uh, and they're attempting to down, to make this work for everybody and have different crews. But Destiny's Child's entourage was 53 people. That's not including any stage or anything like that. I mean, obviously, there's production managers who oversee it, tour managers and stuff. But that's wardrobe and makeup, and, you know, so on and so forth. 53 people. So you've got to help coordinate that. And that's yeah. just one of 11 uh, others. So in the two days left in the thing. You got to snake I'm, your way in there. Oh, I'm yeah. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the thick of it. And there's no sleep, man. I mean, and that's okay. I can do, I can work on, you know, being up for 36 hours. And I did it as a musician, you know, but I had, I do was uh, like, I was very serious and focused. So there was no partying at all. Uh, I figured, There'll come a time when this is over and I'm completely exhausted and I'll be able to crack one open. But uh, right now we're working. Yeah. So I was supposed to have a liaison for each artist in order to reduce the budget. They felt that it would be, you know what? Snake could just talk to someone in each thing and he'll figure it out. So they removed all my liaisons. So now I have no idea who to speak with in any of these camps except kiss and God smack because I knew their manager very well. So I was able to just, Hey man, who's your point guy, but you would contact these other people. You don't know who their point guy is. And so, and you're getting your, you're okay. Here's the contact person on the sheet, but they're like, I don't know. And I'm going, Holy shit. <laughs> and it was a comedy of errors a lot of times like you're walkie talkie the battery just dies and there's no batteries left like things that you don't think about and then you're you're attempting to communicate on your phone and your phone dies and you're like all right so i'm running around to this compound and luckily it went off without a hitch uh for the most part uh everyone we got through it and it was i i think at the end of the day i was up for like nearly 50 hours straight at the end of the day. But there was a great sense of accomplishment after it was over. 
And I was like, man, if I'm ever going to get into the managerial side of things, what a great way to get, you know, thrown in. Jump in the deep end. And so then when, when Doc and, and Scott saw what I was capable of and decisions that I would, would make on my own because I didn't have a choice. I had to make spot on decisions. Um, they were, I guess they saw something and, and then I was a part of McGee entertainment from a managerial side, not just an artistic side. And then went on to start working, you know, co-managing with some other artists and managers and stuff like that. And just, I would go on the road. We had an artist by the name of Randy Coleman, who was like an acoustic songwriter guy, Dabney Coleman's son. And he had an opportunity. We got him a, a tour with Def Leppard and Brian Adams uh, that were doing small minor league baseball stadiums. So 20,000 people, whatever. And so we got him the opening slot, no money, you know, cause no one knew who he was. And, uh, and our travel, our, our means of travel was a rent a car and uh, our lodging was often uh, sleeping on people's floors who were friends of a friend in that particular town. So we would be in Portland and we'd call up a guy that, that the band guys knew because there's only two people going out there. They're just doing an acoustic thing. So there's three of us in the car. And, you know, my last touring experience was, you know, tour buses and nice hotels and everything like that. Sure. But I also was smart enough to know that that, that shit don't matter, man. That, that doesn't fly. You know, you're a manager attempting to be a manager and you're on your way up. You got to be humble and thankful and and gracious. And so I was sleeping on the floor with the other guys and we would wake up and go to do the next thing the next day. And we did that for for a couple months and it was hard, but great. Yeah. And that was that the show with the troops for the troops with Kiss and 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 destiny's child and all that and that particular tour of sleeping on the floor and all that and and you know no techs i mean i was teching essentially and that was fine with me yeah um that was fine with me and it's funny because i'm friends with the guys in def leppard i'd known them forever and they're like what are you doing out here man is the opening band <laughs> so like really <laughs> So I luckily through that, through did my, you associate- any, did you go up on stage? Like with any of the opening bands, would you go on stage for any of the shows or like with the Def Leppard guys, would you jump on stage just cause you're there? No, the- no, 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 no. I wanted to keep the things separate. I wanted to keep yeah. everything separate. Like I wanted, if I'm your manager, I'm not going to go up there. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be on the side of stage, making sure you guys are cool. And if something happens, I'll run out and fix it one way or another, whether it's because cool. you know, there's no one else to do it. And so eventually eventually I started, uh, no, pretty quickly on, I started talking to the Def Leppard crew guys. I'm like, can you just help us out here or help us out there? And, you know, Randy was such a sweetheart of a guy and his guitar player, Carlos, they were just the sweetest guys. So they endeared themselves to everybody, to Brian Adams and his camp and the Def Leppard guys. So that was easy because, you know, sometimes band guys can be troublesome. (laughs) I've heard it. So I had a question here. I had uh, Mark O'Shea on here and he, he began to tell me a story, but wouldn't tell me a story. So it's you guys, Nine Inch Nails, Guns N' Roses. And yes. Anaheim, then you did Wembley Stadium. Okay. Yep. And there's some kind of thing that happened with Jeff Ward. It was a practical joke. And John Reese, was, who's a security guy, was fucking furious about it. What's the story? Do you remember? Do you know what I'm talking about? No. Darn. <laughs> I don't remember. Um, be, uh, was it in Mannheim or Wembley? He said it started in Mannheim and then it, it was in Wembley, and he was like, okay. it was just over the top. And I'm like, what we happened? Were, was- we were engulfed in some other stuff that was going on. I mean, Mannheim was 72,000 people, and we were on a side of stage watching. There was something that happened. Axel had a beef with somebody, and Axel says, That's it, I'm done. So, a good friend of ours, Ozzy Hoppy, was the promoter at the time. and uh, he was a friend and Axel was leaving. He got in a golf cart and the, the dressing rooms were at the other end of the field. Uh, Cause it was a, it was a military field. 
that we were playing in and got in a golf cart and Ozzy got in a golf cart with him, if I'm not mistaken, and took him back to the dressing room. But he alerted all his personnel on the ground to lock every gate to not let Axel out because somehow the show was going to go on. Now, who wait, who, who alerted? Ozzy, the promoter. Ozzy, Ozzy Hoppy. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Um, and Doug Goldstein, who's managing the band, obviously was there as well with Axel. Um, and so we're on the side of stage. It's Scott McGee, myself, Rachel, and Sebastian. And the crowd is chanting something out of anger. And my old singer thinks they're chanting his name. So I'm like, dude, they're not chanting. Stop. And he's getting ready to run out and sing. And I'm like, dude, and I wasn't, I'm sorry. Scott McGee was like, there's no way you cannot. There's no way they're not chanting your name and you're not running out there because we will get thrown off this thing and it'll be, it'll just be a shit show and you're not doing. So he's literally like holding on to Sebastian. because Sebastian's ready to go from the side of stage, right on the stage. So Rachel and I are like, let's get out of here, man. And we go down to the dressing room area. And then we hear this scuffle. And I believe it was between Matt Sorum and Axel. And it was, um, we don't know what was going on in there. It, we were just, Rachel and I kind of looked at each other like, man, let's, we need to be somewhere else. You know, we, I mean, because we had done our set and it was great. Somehow Axel decides, okay, cool, I'll go back. And they were amazing. Like there was just this electricity that happened after all that happened. And I was like, wow, like that's, that's some of the craziest shit I've seen. Like I've never been a party to that really, you know, and, but they were great. They were, man, they were on fire. And, uh, and then Wembley, we got hit with uh, uh, a, a notice from the judiciary uh, body of that area of the UK called the Brent Council that became aware of uh, one of our songs called Get the Fuck Out. And they were saying that we can't play that song or, or we'll be banned from Wembley for life. So being the precocious, arrogant, assholes that we are uh we went out and and our singer read that on stage and wiped his ass with it (laughs) and we broke into the song and uh the crowd went berserk it was it was certainly a moment but yeah we got banned from Wembley for that (laughs) like all of Wembley like okay not only can you not play the stadium you can't play the arena and you can't play a club here like so we went back headlining a couple years later. We're like, oh no, <laughs> what are we going to do here? We can't play anywhere in Wembley. They remembered. I think they forgot about it by now, but yeah. And so I'm not aware of the practical joke because we were sort of engulfed in some other drama that was going on. But I'll tell you one thing. Here we go. I would never want to get John Reese pissed off. Yeah. He's one of my friends i love him dearly he can crush people very easily and i used to get him to beat up scott mcgee all the time it was the best <laughs> on that on the guns and roses tour i'd be like i'd be standing it'd be john scott and i and i'd be going look i don't I, john i don't want to start anything but scott's been being a real prick to everybody in the band he's like he's bullying everybody he goes really and then he'd go after Scott and Scott would be running away and he'd grab Scott or punch him in the back of the head, <laughs> like laying it in there. Cause they come from a, that, that professional uh, sports world. Like Scott was a wide receiver in the NFL and the CFL. And so Scott's put together, but he's no John Reese. Like John Reese is obviously a, a big man. And he used to, I used to get Scott beat up so much, but that in turn got me beat up later on. So. Yeah, one of the guys on here, he told me, I think it was on Kiss with you guys, and he said, you went up, it was, you went up, Sebastian was there, and you walked in, and it was like, what's up, Sebastian? And you punched him, and then he's like, what's up, Snake? And he punched you, and he said, this just happened like three times in a row, and then they just left. Like, they didn't say anything to each other. They just punched each other and left. Who did? 
It was you and Sebastian, he said. The roadie, uh, what's his name? We punched each other? He said you guys just punched each other and you just kept punching each other harder? And then you Oh, I, I believe that. Yeah, yeah. I, I believe that. Sure. <laughs> uh, I believe that. We used, I used to do that with Scott more often, but I, I could see that happening. Sure. Yeah, fun. Okay. So um, when I was going to put together this podcast, the idea was, uh, I, I was coming up with the idea at my friend's house and he has a five, uh, a daughter in fifth grade. And she was with some of her little friends and they said, you need to ask every guest when they first felt famous. So bear in mind, this is a little girl. So to make it a broader sense, if need be, you can say when you first felt famous, but if you want to make it broader, it could be when you first felt uh, successful, you were on the right path. There was a moment in your career that you smiled, that, that there's just something that happened. It was a pivotal time for you that you're proud of possibly. What would each of you guys say would that, that would be? TJ, oh. you've been silent for a while, so you go first. Yeah, what do you got, TJ? Yeah, I'm used to that because you never really just shut the fuck up. So I never I'm, do. I've no. been doing that, listening to you my whole life. Oh, it's it's diarrhea that's that's <laughs> you know perpetual. So first of all, I, I I don't I'm not famous. I don't think I'm famous. I've never felt that. The the closest thing that I can say is that I did had and Snake hit on it earlier, where you have a little bit of sense of accomplishment, of you know I get thrown into a production like. Kiss, Ted Nugent, um, the first couple shows, I've never did, done an arena show that big. So I was nervous the week leading up getting to Tucson, Arizona for the first show, load in, who to see, who not to see, what to do, what, you know, I, I was really nervous. And doing club shows with these guys was one thing because it's a bar, it's very intimate, things go wrong. I could blame other people, I could do other things, but you're in a pro arena setting. There's nobody to blame but yourself. And the couple of times that in the beginning where the guys were like, Hey, thanks, man. Where it was no big deal to them because they're professionals, they're musicians, they pull up, they know what to do, but just getting that, Hey, thanks, man. Like we did it. I didn't get, I didn't get fired. I, I, there was no major drama on stage, off stage, TJ, you know, more or less pulled it off. Um, that's an accomplishment. And knowing that you had a little piece of making that happen, uh, you know, makes you feel, I don't want to say famous, but makes you feel like you're part of, of the scene of that show, of that concert, of that fan that paid $75 to see the show that's in the front row singing every lyric to Skid Row songs. And you're, you're feeding off them. You're feeding off watching Snake play, entertaining the crowd, watching the crowd feedback off Snake. And they're going back and forth. And here's me in the shadows, dressed in black, just watching that. You, I got goosebumps. And I was like, okay, that, I was proud of that moment that yeah. I had yeah. a something to be a part of it. And yeah. Well, yeah, that, 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 that moment doesn't happen without you guys being able to lay the groundwork for it to happen. That, that's one of the things that I was never lost on, uh, was never lost on me, I should say. Um, because I, like I said earlier, when, when you, you're out, with these guys who are, have been on the road forever, like, you know, like TJ had mentioned, he had been out with, you know, uh, agnostic front and, 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 uh, MOD. And he's been friends forever with the guys from ignite and going out and, and doing those shows. They might be smaller shows, but they're intense, man. They are intense. You've got people on and off that stage constantly. You've got to make sure that not only is the band protected, but the, the which is obviously first and foremost, but you got to make sure that the gear is remaining intact. You've got to make sure that the band is actually able to finish their show somehow. Yeah. And that's, that's a very difficult thing. That's one of the things I, 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 I re realized after watching uh, TJ's movie like just how chaotic those situations become. Yeah. And people don't, I, I don't know if people know fully with the exception of the people who have been in that scene and are still in that scene. Like you look at old footage from uh, black flag in Southern California and it's insane. It's insane. Yeah. You know, and even, and even after that uh, the bands that came after that in, in Southern California, you know, the, the ignite guys um, it's insane stuff that, I don't think people, a lot of bands that might be like our, you know, my peers or whatever, our peers uh, don't quite understand unless they, they were privy to that. Like there was a scene in New Brunswick, New Jersey that I was on the periphery of per se. I knew a lot of the players, 
but it wasn't my music as much as the music that we make is. And uh, but I had friends who were in these, you know, hardcore punk bands and the shows were absolutely insane. I mean, you know, along the lines and not as uh, intense, if I will, uh, and, and graphic as Gigi Allen. But man, <laughs> you know what? Maybe there wasn't, you know, human feces being thrown at anybody and wiped all over themselves, but the intensity of the audience and that confrontation between the two things, not that they're angry or pissed at each other, it's just this music was bringing out animal instincts in people. And the, the hope is that those things can mesh together and not become uh, adversarial. And they and did. Most of the time, I'm sorry. Yeah, and they did. They always did. I mean, there's no laminates in the hardcore scene. There's everybody's on stage, in and out of the dressing room. It's all friends, it, and it was something that I wasn't accustomed to. Right. Um, when they're when the when you're watching the gear and you're trying to watch the tuning and the pedal board, and then there's there's you turn you lift your head up and there's 35 people on stage and there's mosh pits and there's stage diving. It's it's totally different than having your whole stage left set aside for you. So you can have guitar world and you can, you can have your cup of coffee and it's different. It doesn't. <laughs> well, I'm sure, different. I'm sure it was quite a relief to be, be on the road for, you know, eight, nine months in, in arenas and not having, you know, one person jump on stage. Cause you know, Kiss's security is lining the front of that stage and there's no one that's going to get up there. Correct. And so, you, and, you know, and you're able to do your job. The only time that we ever had a problem was when we would go out after the show, and <laughs> and then you're in a, you're in some other club, and every once in a while, and this is the wonderful thing about being friends with your road crew because they have your back, man. And every once in a while, someone will approach the band, and they're drunk and they're saying shitty stuff about the band. Memphis. <laughs> yep. Memphis. And Memphis. <laughs> and. We'll be around a table and this guy is a stranger and, and from what he's saying is now unwelcome and TJ sitting next to you and he hears what this kid says. And the kid says it, I don't want to say kid, he's a man. So this man says something derogatory about the band with all of us there. And TJ just goes, what, what, I'm sorry, what did you say? And he repeated it verbatim. And in one moment, my friend sitting next to me is flying across the table with a fist at this guy's face. And it was the most amazing thing I've seen. And that you sit there and you walk away from that. Like no one got hurt. The kid, kid got punched in the face. He deserved it. Didn't end up in a hospital that we know of. And that could have been really bad. Like we all could have been on this guy kicking and beating the fuck out of him. Cause he was an asshole, but we were like, man, I, you know, TJ just knocked this fucking guy out. We don't think we need to go any further. Is that when you first felt famous? <laughs> no, but that's no. I tell you what, though. <laughs> I, I always knew. It goes back to that Jersey thing, man. You know everybody. If you don't know somebody in the, in the circle, you know somebody who knows somebody in the circle. So that makes you part of the circle. Okay. And that, there was always a great respect and camaraderie of the musicians in New Jersey, regardless if you were in like uh, uh, vision, you know, who's a, was a hardcore punk band or, or just a hardcore band, I guess you would say. And the guys in Skid Row uh, and then the, you know, Bobby Epps from genocide, God rest his soul. And, but there was, we all got along. Like we all got along. We weren't, no one was judgmental. Everybody was doing their thing. And we, we all respected that. And so that was a great camaraderie that, to be honest, I'm sure that exists in other cities. Uh, I don't think it existed in L.A. in the 80s. Uh, I, I have a feeling that, you know, judging from what Metallica and Megadeth have said about what was happening on Sunset Boulevard, I don't think that existed in L.A., but it definitely existed for us. And, and for the band, that Jersey um, was its own thing away from New York City. We were in such close proximity, but we were still our own thing. I'm very proud of it. And, and to this day, you know, I'm a Jersey boy. I live in Long Island, but I'm a Jersey boy. 
So you and, do you because one of my, my friend uh, Darren Paltrowitz, he runs a podcast and he's a reporter and stuff. And he said he asked me to ask you then. So, what, do you feel that you're part of the Long Island scene at all? Unfortunately, I don't think there's much of a scene out here anymore, uh, especially since COVID happened. Then a lot of the clubs that were uh, hanging on uh, are are here. I used to have a club right down the street from me called Revolution, and all the bands that I I was would play with alongside of in in the late 80s early 90s would pass through there all people I knew who who I've been friends with forever and it was great I literally ride my bicycle 10 minutes down the street and I'm there excuse me so uh because of COVID it closed and it was so sad and now it's some like really strange religious thing but that was right there and helmet played there for god's sakes like it was just you could one week you'd see faster pussycat and then you see helmet like really this is awesome yeah and then you see whitford st holmes there you know which was i was like this is right down the street this is the greatest thing in the world sure and so and there's the paramount out here which is a great venue and and we play that we were playing it every november for a little while just a great great venue but as far as, you know, I know that Mark Mendoza from, from Twisted Sister was doing a jam thing on Tuesday nights somewhere. And I believe Bobby Rondinelli was doing the same thing. So that was really, that was really cool and keeping a circle together. But it doesn't really exist right now. And it sucks. Because I would love to be a the, part of it. What are some of the funniest gigs you guys have played at or worked at? So, like, example, uh, I had Elton John's percussionist on. He was actually on with Peter Feinstone. Remember Peter? Peter from Bad Religion. So, oh, yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. Peter Sorry. was there. So, um, his was the uh, Elton John, man. It was a fucking strip club for a Russian wedding. And he goes, and there was no room on the stage. We had to get his grand piano up on the stage. He goes, so where my keyboard was set up, he's like, I was or my percussion was set up rather he's like, the, the stripper pole is like right here. And I'm like trying to get around it to play. <laughs> And you know what? And Elton got paid a shit ton what an of money. Insane, crazy. He probably got like 400 bitcoins. I don't know, something nuts. But did you guys like early on? You must have had some gigs that were like, where the fuck are we? Yeah. All right. Go ahead, TJ. No, I was just going to say in, in, in the clubs in Europe, I mean, I don't know how many small clubs snakes played in Europe, but you go, you roll into some towns in Germany and you're in a dungeon, an old castle. The sound is terrible. There's no oh, prog. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, was it fun, funny at the time? No, definitely not. But you look back now and it was, uh, you know, I'll, those clubs aren't there anymore. And I was glad to be a part of that. I mean, we, yeah. with MOD, our first tour every year was, was, and the first show was the marquee in London. I didn't know it at the time, but but that's that's a, a monumental. That's the CBGBs of London, and yeah, uh, we played there to, as well. To play some of those clubs back in that the hiatus of live music, it was a, it was an honor to be the stage manager or or whatever to be part of that. And you're advancing shows with people who are legends in the business. So fun, probably not, but now like I'm, I'm humbled, blessed, and very fortunate to have seen what I've seen and, and been where I've been. We played a show very early on. Uh, it wasn't the lost horizon in, in upstate New York, but it was in that area. And it was basically an old Mexican restaurant. And so it had these arches with stucco on them in front of the stage and there one of the pillars of the uh of the arches was like literally right in the middle of the the front of the stage and our promo for the show was a piece of ripped up white line paper written in pen the date the name of the band featuring bon jovi's ex-guitar player that was our promotion. It was thumbtacked to one of the pillars in the middle of the club for maybe a week. We had six people there. <laughs> six people. That's humbling. Yeah. And they didn't like it. We went out there. We talked to each other before the show. And we're like, you know what? This is kind of like a paid rehearsal, but let's go on. And, and what happened to TJ? Let's go on and uh, I'll let him back in if he pops back on. 
let's go out and um, play like it's Madison Square Garden, man. Yeah. And we did. Yeah, yeah. well, the six people that are there, you give them the best show they got. It, and I bet, I bet those six people, I bet it's memorable for them. I oh, hope it. hell yeah. Six people and you're watching Skid Row? Come on. I could well, hear somebody. I could hear somebody saying, "Yeah, I saw them when there was only five other people there." I could see people saying that. Yeah, it's a cool story. Yeah, what were some jobs you had before you went into music? Oh man. Uh well, my brother was a, a long haul truck driver, so in the summertime, I'd work with him as as a, as a youngster. I ended up actually going to California with him uh los angeles when i was 15 and spent the summer out there santa monica um i worked for the township uh in the sewage department oh <laughs> yeah basically cleaning up shit on the side of the road like uh you know like a prisoner uh oh, <laughs> i worked uh painting fire hydrants for the township and I basically painted two fire hydrants and uh, then spray painted or, or uh, painted in, in fluorescent green uh, my band's logo uh, on a basketball court in one of the parks. That's awesome. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I worked selling tools out of the trunk of my car uh, in various parking lots and, and street corners in New York and New Jersey. I worked in warehouses, delivering mail, uh, working in a print shop. Uh, I worked in warehouses as a picker where you get these orders and you pick all these small items and put them into a bin and send sure. them on a conveyor belt. I worked as an assistant bar manager for a Were you getting bar. fired from all these jobs? <laughs> I quit them all. I quit them all. It's a lot of gigs. Okay. Oh, yeah, dude. Well, I've been working since uh, I was a dishwasher when I was 16. You know, like I, my, the, there's a strong work ethic in my family. My mother cleaned houses her whole life till, you know, till six months before she passed away. Wow. Um, you know, my grandmother came over from, from Poland uh, when she was 16 with, you know, very little money in her pocket and, uh, and she cleaned houses. So that's how my mother learned. She wow. would go with my grandmother. And I saw this. I saw how hard she worked every day. My dad uh, moved out when I was very young and he went to live down in Florida, but he would send a check home every two weeks. He was good like that. Um, but my mom worked her ass off. And yeah. so when we are and it's funny because all the guys that uh, we have in the band and, and started the band with, they're all middle class, lower middle class, uh, blue collar man. Yeah. So everyone has a strong work ethic, uh, which boded very well. Yeah. Um, How come? So I read there. So you bought the name Skid Row. Yes. Why didn't you guys just come up with another name? Skid Row is such a great name. How much did you pay for Skid Row? Was it stupid small or no? Yeah, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a large amount. We didn't even. I mean, I'm sure it got paid back, but I think Doc ended up paying for it. No, no way. Or us. Yeah. Uh, it's cool to hear, like listening to you, like how instrumental Doug or uh, Doc was really. And know, Scott, I, I don't like, want, I don't want to let that be unspoken. Scott played a really, really big part in our formative years and, and made some great like decisions. Father, fatherly figures, like totally steering you guys in the right direction. Scott is like a brother to me, uh, even though we don't work together on a band manager level or a manager manager level. He's still one of my dearest friends. He was in my wedding and uh, yeah. we still, I'm sure we're going to work together again on something. That's cool. uh, and doc, doc is my mentor, my big brother. Uh, he's the guy that gives me the security in life to know that if everything in my life gets screwed up, nice to have you back. I don't know. Good I'm, job. Greg. Yeah, sorry about that. I don't know yeah, what I thought, happened. I thought you were a tech. I'm not. I'm not at all. I'm an analog guy. You know, it's so funny. So many of the roadies have pop on. They suck at this. Ah, <laughs> Try to get it to play. Whatever reason, the whole, whole computer just went dead. I don't know. I lost. I don't know. Whatever. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, you're fine. All good. So, yeah, the, the McGee brothers are, you know, Doc is, is the guy that, and Scott, but Doc is the guy that I know 
that if everything in my life goes wrong for me, I can go to him and I will get an answer. And to be quite honest, it's the same thing with John. Like, mm -hmm. cause John is a very, very smart, shrewd, uh, businessman who has a lot of wisdom beyond his years, but he's also a really good life coach, uh, just offering advice as a, as a brother. I mean, he, the guy is my brother. Like he's, we, our conversations and our, our, um, relationship goes far deeper than, than music. You know, what I remember that night you came. So what happened was, TJ, I, I was doing a movie or I'd done a movie and I needed music. And so I just brought in all these like I had Dizzy from Guns N' Roses. I think he had already done a lot of the music. And I think we played Dizzy stuff to you. Mm -hmm. And then but what was really neat about that? And I think Peter was in the room with you. I think it was you and Peter for a while. But I can't remember. Anyway, what I remember about Snake was you, you were so fast it coming up with the riffs. Um, and I just, and I tell people, you know, oh. it's not being like a really great musician. It, it's, it's the speed of just like, how about this? And we'd listen to be like, wow, that was so good. Oh, so thank you for saying that, man. I, uh, that's really a great compliment. I appreciate that because I, there it was a, a long time ago. It, it, I made a decision that I realized that, you know, there's always going to be, there's always going to be people who play faster than you and shred more than you and who are just much, much better lead guitar players. Um, but the, the beauty of, of is in the composition of the song. Yeah. That's the beauty. That's where you can capture anybody's attention. Um, not just a guitar player or, or, or someone who's on a periphery a casual player or whatever. Uh, and that's like all these guys that are heroes of mine were not only just the most unbelievable guitar players, but they were amazing songwriters. Yeah. And I recognize that pretty early on, you know, again, looking at the, the sleeve of a record or the back of a record, who wrote the songs? Oh, Tyler Perry, Tyler Perry, you know, Paige Plant. Um, I was like, Ooh, Okay, I get it now. Yeah, I get it. Like that's the magic that that occurs. And so for me, the big moment in my career came when Rachel and I met, and we started attempting to write songs together, and quickly realized that we got along great, and that he would do some things that were better than me, and and I might do some things that were better than him. And together, we filled the gaps in each other's abilities. And uh, that was such a great realization because you, I, I, I remember feeling like, oh, my gosh, I have like my musical compadre now. Like I found <laughs> the guy. He, he, we found each other. It was all Did very you guys knock these out quickly. Was it just clockwork or no? It was hard on some of them. No, no, it was hard. Quicksand Jesus on our second record took three, four months to write. Wow. Yeah. We have a and it, we talk about this. Our songs are never quick, man. Never. It's just the way we're very uh, critical of each other's ideas. And we have to, uh, we, we, we go through it and analyze it probably a lot more than we need to. We've loosened up that sort of mentality uh, in the last few years or whatever, just to not beat ourselves up so much with every little word in line. Like let's take a step back and see if this actually is the right thing. Yeah. Instead of being so, you know, laser focused and, and maybe losing the emotional aspect of what you're working on. Okay. All right. So here we go. So uh, TJ, where can I get, uh, or where can I watch your movie? So basically uh, it's just starting to hit the streaming platforms. Now we're on three or four, uh, from Google Play and a couple other ones. It's, all the information is on roadyfilm.com. That's the easiest to do. Um, I'm so not a tech nerdy guy and I'm still learning social media. So I, I do my best to, to put it out there to everybody. And What's your Facebook? You know, What's your Facebook? It's, it's Rody, uh, Rody Film or, or Rody My Documentary. Cool. Uh, you'll be able to find it for sure. Um, 
You know, I'm just going to say one thing is, you know, I've, I've never in my life asked for a handout. I've never asked for anything free. I've always wanted that just an opportunity and, and snake and Rachel and Scotty and those guys gave me an opportunity to, to go on tour with them and work with them and, and get to experience a hundred something kiss shows. And I'm forever grateful uh, to snake for that. Um, and the same thing with, with you, Joel, and, and thank you for having me. Oh, thanks here to give me the opportunity just to let people know that look i'm just some guy that was very fortunate to land in some really cool places and i've been around the world a couple of times and i'm very fortunate and grateful and and if anybody wants to see or or see what it's like to be you know to a little peek behind the curtain uh, that's all i'm going to ask for and the opportunity uh, to have that just the peak it's a fun watch it's i found it really is tj i give you a lot of credit man i know you've been working your ass on this for a long time i remember when we were mike thompson's basement and uh and it to me uh i don't know how you feel i I hope you feel the same but it was it was well worth it man there's really some great stuff on there great insight uh there's peaks and valleys as far as where your emotions go and stuff. Uh, you know, obviously the stuff with cliff and whatnot and, and a firsthand experience of that. And so everything is, is, which is great is a firsthand experience from a different perspective that the general public isn't really aware of. So I I love seeing that stuff, hearing people talk that I, I don't know who they are. I thought the, the gentleman you spoke with regarding the history of touring starting in 68 with Bill Graham, I was like, wow, like, that's really cool. Like I didn't yeah. know that, with you all know, the and stuff. there was a bunch of stuff that, yeah, the whole owner brothers thing and the way that they had the picture of the crew on the back. I was like, I love that so much, Yeah, you know? So for me, having been doing this for 30 some odd years on, on, you know, every level, uh, uh, to me, it was, it was like, it was eye opening on certain things. I thought I saw it all. And, uh, obviously I haven't. So I, I give you, I know I break your balls for the last 35 years or whatever, and, and I'm still a better golfer than you, but <laughs> the thing is, is that you've done a really, really great job. And I, I encourage anybody who's watching this to absolutely, you have to go check it out because it really offers insight into an often uh, overlooked and unmentioned area of the music business. And it, it, I don't think people understand the importance, Henry Rollins does, but I don't think you know the general public understands the importance of what goes in to that show that they're witnessing for a couple hours on a, on a Friday night. I just, I, and, and this show is like, you know, people loading in at seven in the morning and loading out at, at two in the morning, you know, I mean, five cool. nights a week, that's hard. It's hard Thanks. stuff. And, and everybody that, you know, that you've talked to in the documentary, you know, exhibits that and, and is very informative uh, for I like, never knew for Dennis me. McGivern could be so eloquent. <laughs> he's the best <laughs> <laughs> oh it's all a facade i've got a dictionary toilet paper that i use so i come up with new new words that i don't know what they mean <laughs> one thing i want to uh, I, I, is uh wind ups do you guys have any good ones from any tours where uh you know uh, the last show wind ups uh pranks that kind of thing every end of tour ended somehow with like I got taped to a chair at the end of the Bon Jovi tour and got eggs thrown at me while I was on stage. I got duct taped to a chair and just thoroughly embarrassed. But what what we did at the end of the Aerosmith tour was they would be playing uh, Janie's got a gun and and the stage uh, would come up behind Joe Perry and smoke would billow up and these lights were underneath. It was a very cool effect. Well, we had, uh, blow up sex dolls come up out of it as well and at the same time we kidnapped their keyboard player pulled down his pants below his knees and then duct taped his thighs and his upper body and carried him out out laid him on stage in front of steven tyler and the band and he could do nothing except like flirt around like a fish uh, that was it and and so the, the end of this guns and roses tourists all that stuff. It's there's always pranks being played. And, What'd you guys do and, on guns? 
Uh, we didn't do anything. I, I forget what they did. I think they all came out riding their bicycles in, in the in the middle of our show and, you know, attempting to run us over or something like that. I don't quite remember if, if there's anything more, but the 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 biggest thing was, uh, you know, you, you it was the Bon Jovi thing for sure. Uh, the Pantera guys, we would we would mess with each other every night. So there wasn't, you know, I would have. 7-Eleven beef and bean burritos uh, taped to my headstock of my guitar and, and they'd start shooting fireworks off when we were, when we were playing like we, and we loved each other so much that we would travel on each other's buses. And I think as far as camaraderie goes, aside from the Bon Jovi tour, uh, the camaraderie between bands that we had uh, with Pantera was like, it was a very special, special thing. And, Obviously, I'm still working with Philip Anselmo in Down and, and you know, with, with Rex and, and whatnot. So um, I'm just, I'm very, very grateful to have had all these experiences. And, and, you know, for TJ's, for TJ's movie, because it definitely, you know, I can't re reiterate enough. It, it, it reaffirmed in me. Uh, and like I said, it'll show people who are not in the know just how important the work that these guys do unheralded yeah uh and you know what there should be a spot in the rock and roll hall of fame for guys from behind the scenes not just managers and stuff like that people who have you know been a, like an opie you know yeah lumpy. yeah Opie's lumpy man. yeah lumpy. i'm working on that snake i'm working on getting a roadie room uh even if it's just a temporary uh type of display with some of the archival different roadie stuff that went on, great. Uh, you know, look, Lemmy was a roadie for Jimi Hendrix, and there's yep. there's yeah. stuff floating around. So, yeah, that's that's uh, when I have spare time. That's what I work on. <laughs> Good guys, I've got to go pick up my kids at school, so I've got to roll. Thank you. It was thank really you, good. Joel. Great to see you again, man. Thanks, yeah, for man. And this. I really appreciated you helping me all those years ago. At the time, yeah, so much. I pleasure. was like trying so hard, and I didn't know what to do. So, no, I get so. it. I get it. Um, glad I could be a part of it. And if you guys want to continue this like later on today or something, I'm, I'm as soon as I pick the kids up from school, I'm kind of wide open. So game, it's up to you, TJ. I, I'd love to. Yeah. It's, it okay. So I'll save this and then I'll, maybe I'll try and come up with some other fun stuff too. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe by clicking the round button on the bottom right. To learn more about me or the guests on the show, go to joelrody.com. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, or TikTok. The handle's Joel Rody. And don't forget, when you party like a rock star, don't be a dick. <laughs>